Okay, so on the Wayne Nicholson show today, we have on a very special guest. His name is Stephen Parry Valentine. He's the sort of guy that you love to hate because he makes <laughs> a very lucrative business out of traveling the world with his wife and filming it, filming all his adventures for YouTube. So those of you that are listening or watching that uh, are curious about how to uh, travel the world and make a, a lucrative living out of it, um, this is the podcast for you. So how are you, mate? <laughs> Um, past tense because of what's going on in the world at the well, moment, kind of homebound a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I bet. I bet. And you know, it's not only that, it's that you're a new father because you're, you had a baby daughter this year. She's two months old. Yes. And also wanted to talk to you about COVID, uh, this, this, you know, tragic, uh, d you know, um, pandemic that's happening because it's affected all travel business. Definitely. So, but also at the same time, it makes you become a little bit more diverse in your skills and what you're going to do. Yeah. And uh, also I wanted to talk to you about the pros and cons of traveling. Yeah, that's Because it's fun. something you don't really hear a lot about, you know, and um, because I do a bit of travel myself and it can get very tiring. Yes. And I don't do it for a living. So that's something I wanted to have a chat to you about as well. Yeah, that sounds so, fun. Now, first <laughs> of all, thanks so much for having me on the podcast. I mean, this is really amazing. Yeah. Because um, I suppose... I was your student about how long ago? 2008? A long time ago. 11, 12 years ago. And long it's really cool. Ago. And I'll be chatting with you now because I definitely learned so many experiences from you. Do you know what? <clears throat> it's one of the best things I've done. I mean, it's one of the things I love to do. But so many of my past students now are doing incredible things. Um, I'm getting messages from students. I got one yesterday. And uh, she lives in Malaysia and she's actually in the process. She's going through interview stages of um, doing her first feature film, Zombie wow. Apocalypse. Wow. Uh, with a, quite a big budget. Um, and she only graduated two years ago. Wow. So, you know, and I look back and I'm, I'm most of my friends that I sort of contact, I'm in contact with now are past students, but yes. they're just friends, you know, doing their own thing. And it's, and it's really cool. But, but I think that's the charm with you, Wayne, because you are just such a good lecturer that you, we kind of want to keep in touch with you. I mean, I'm not speaking to any of my past teachers from 11, 12 years ago. I mean, it's just, not only did you teach us the fundamentals of film at FTI, but just fundamentals of, you know, how to be a better person and stuff. And that's why it's just so much fun to show you. It's almost like a father figure, like, oh, hey, you. Wayne, look what I'm doing now. So, I mean, it's really amazing. Um, I'm the proud parent looking yeah. at it, looking <laughs> looking at all my famous students getting getting out there, doing, doing different things as well. Yeah, you know? definitely. I mean, just even the cohort just after me with um, with Emma and she's running a horror YouTube channel where she reviews horror. And I think she just got yes. certified on Rotten Tomatoes as a critic, which wow. that's, that's really cool. I mean, there's just... And then you've got Steve Brown. I mean, he's yeah. an amazing, you know, artwork that That's he's right. doing. That's you've, right. You've definitely got a diverse. Well, I was friends. in a, I was in a lucky period of time that I was teaching. <laughs> 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 but you know, um, a lot of people have asked me because um, I was telling them before. You know, when, when it was about a couple of months ago. But a lot of people have been looking forward to you coming on oh, because thank you appreciate. Well, it. who doesn't love traveling? Yes, traveling is is. Definitely a an amazing experience because it's one of those things you look forward to. I mean, I know. It, of course, right now it's quite hard to look forward to travel because you're just so uncertain. But this everyone can relate booking that trip to Bali or booking that Europe trip, and then you're counting down. You have the little app on your phone, 150 days till my trip, and it's just it's excitement because you just get you know filled with serotonin and you just want to go do all these things well, you especially, would never do especially when people look forward to that once maybe once a year once every two years you yes know? Uh, let me have a look yeah so for 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 somebody now let's go back to the beginning okay how did it all start well so i mean it definitely started with this passion for film i mean this started um in high school. And then when I finished high school, you had your chat with your counselor and he's trying to work you out where you should go after year 12. And he said, what do you like? And I said, oh, I like film. I like media at, at school. And um, I won the media award because I just love doing it so much. And I saw this little course at FTI and I'm the type of person that wants to get things done now because I saw the TAFE course three years or I could go to FTI nine months, you know, boot camp, hard work, get in there, get out. And that's where I suppose I met you. And I definitely 
kind of pursued this passion for film and then um, realized that I, I lived in Perth and there really wasn't too much of a film industry in Perth, yeah, let alone Australia. I mean, you always see these news articles of Australia's cutting the funding to the entertainment industry. And it's, it's just like that tired old saying, you need to go to Hollywood to make it anywhere. And I, I think that kind of hit hard hit hard because I just studied and I was 19 and I wasn't ready to move to America. So I went and got a real degree, as my parents said. So I went and studied marketing, advertising and public relations. Um, and once I finished that, uh, I kind of started working full time. And I'd been with my wife for about, well, she wasn't my wife. She was my girlfriend for about 10 years then. Yeah. And my parents were saying, you need to um, settle down, get married, pop out some grandkids. And that just... Wow, that threw us off. We just were like, no. Nah. <laughs> so we quit our jobs and booked a one-way flight to um, to America and decided to pick up a little vlogging camera and start a YouTube channel. And this was in 2015. And um, yeah, we started filming our daily life every single day for 500 days straight. So this, oh, was so like, this is not just traveling or? This is this... traveling at the same time. So we, we started the YouTube channel to showcase us traveling the world. It was more of like a, hey, mom and dad, I'm still alive here in America sure. or in Costa Rica. And um, I'd always had this passion for film. So I really just wanted to push myself. So yeah, as we were traveling full time, we were filming, editing and uploading a video every single day. So daily vlogging. Daily vlogging, yes. Wow. And um, amazing experience. Wouldn't wish it against anybody because it is mentally draining. And especially at the same time, if you're traveling, because as you said, at the top of the podcast, traveling can be a little bit exhausting, it's especially because you forget about the actual traveling bit, yeah. sitting in a plane for 19 hours and you're just yeah. like, what's the next movie I can watch? And it can be mentally and physically draining. Yeah. So then at the same time, we're also creating videos at the same time. So my day would start, wake up at 7 a.m., we'd go out and travel, film our day, uh, then come home at about 6, 7 p.m., open up Premiere Pro, start editing it, maybe finish it at midnight, maybe 1 a.m., upload it, do a cover photo, get it ready to go out, 7 a.m. the next day, start that again. So I did that for a year and a half straight before we said, nope, this is too much. And we cut down to about three videos I'm a week. I'm not surprised because I do know a lot of people have stopped daily vlogging. The, yes. the, the ones that we always looked at. Yes. Um, because it just got too much. Yeah. It got too much, especially if you, if you are married or you've got a life other than, if you were alone doing it, mm -hmm. even then it would be a lot. But um, if you want to have a balanced life, it's very hard to do. But Definitely. the fact you did it for a year and a half, yeah, it was about right? 550 episodes wow. straight. Yeah, I mean, it definitely taught me a lot. Not only how to, you know, learn to film and edit in a, you know, quicker way, but also just the mental kind of understanding of going into this. Because once you're in that deep hole, <laughs> it's almost very hard to jump out of it. Did you have a sort of a style or how long did it take you to sort of get a format of what your videos were wow. like leaving the nest, you know, you've got your intro and you know, like your maybe whatever it is. Did you have a, a sort of a strategy? Did it, did that come to you quite early? Or? Not at all. Oh, Not really? at all. So we've been doing YouTube for five years now and I would say it took us three and a half years. I think for those first three and a half years, cause that's up to maybe seven, 800 episodes we didn't really have a strategy and you can even see that because if you go back and watch those old videos they're not very good and there weren't many people watching those videos i think it was you know 2017 2000 maybe more 2018 that we sat down and said why are people watching our videos and we realized well we're a travel channel we should probably give some travel advice um show people where to eat where to go and that moment when we realized that and actually sorted out a reason for the videos, you can see the quality goes up yeah. and also the subscribers went up. Yeah. So more people were actually tuning in probably because the videos were getting, you know, okay. Well, you were, you were, in, you were starting to, you know, we always looked at the three E's like educate, entertain and engage. Definitely. So you were probably entertaining, you were engaging, but were you educating people in something new? Yeah. So when you learn that, then people started to go, oh, 
I need to look at these guys more. Definitely. Because that's probably a country I'm going to or want to go to. So, yeah. And you learn that. You'd, and it took you how long before that? Three years, three wow. and a half years. Yeah. So I think people were tuning in. Um, so I think maybe we had about 50, 60,000 subscribers, which is a massive amount like on paper. Yeah. But that from is. year three to year four, we went up to 200,000. I've heard that. Yeah. I've and then heard that. It is a little bit of a... a it gets quicker the it more... Does. So Because if you've... I remember you telling me this. If you have 100 people that tell one of the... Every one of those 100 subscribers yeah. tell another person, that's 200. That's 200. But if you've got 100,000 telling other people, yeah, it grows quicker. Most definitely. Know? And I always like to say, because like me and my wife were kind of just sitting down and being like, where are we going? I think we had a breakdown in our third year. I mean, we were wanting to start a family. I'm not surprised. Yeah. And I'm looking at the funds and we were, we were traveling the world. Like we were living the dream job, but we had no money. We were just skin broke. And then she's like, oh, I'd really like a baby. I'm like, we cannot bring a newborn <laughs> into this world and not be able to afford nappies, let alone, you know, more than two minutes That's noodles. That's for you. <laughs> When, you, when you're struggling up that sand cliff, you know, and you <laughs> want a baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, that's when we really sat down and said, we need to look at this and what are we doing wrong? And thankfully, Strategy. Mm. we worked it out, which has been great. And it's been amazing. Like the last few years, um, there's been exponential growth, I think. On our YouTube channel, I think we're about up to 870,000 yeah, people. That's yeah. amazing. Amazing. I mean, like, how much does the whacker fill? I mean, is that like, you look at that and you think if everyone was just there watching you, you would just... You know, I. it's hard to tell. I mean, I've got nowhere near that. But it's weird, like, when I was talking, like, on the podcast, I've only done 17 and there's, like, 26,000 um, um, listeners. And it, it is, like, um, I've got people sending me quotes of my podcast, like this one, um, with a photo of them listening to the That's podcast so nice. in Belgium and all of that. Oh, you, wow. you must know that. But to listen for an hour and a half to a podcast, and some of these quotes have been right at the end of the podcast. So I know they have listened, you know. To the end, yeah. <laughs> but even that, I'm sitting there going, these guys don't even know me. But yeah. That's the power of the internet. So I can't even imagine having 800 and something thousand people. Yeah. Um, There's definitely watching. pros and cons to what, that. What, what, what is that? Well, I mean, of course, it's amazing because we are able to live our passion, which is travel, and we're able to work for ourselves. Massive pros. I yeah. mean, it, it's kind of cool. When I, I suppose when I was at film school with you, when you sit down to even just make a short film, the amount of paperwork, back end, like shot lists, finding the right staff, everything. And then by the time you finished it, maybe it's six months down the line. When I'm, you know, working for myself, if I have an idea, you can just film it, edit it, get it up that week, which yeah. is just, and then you, you know, with 850,000 people, you have instant feedback. So you. That's the great thing with yeah. YouTube. Yeah, so you can put something out. Maybe you wanted to try something different uh, and then people will tell you, no, nah, I don't like that. Or no, that's amazing. Do more of that. So you have that instant feedback and then you're like, cool, for next week, I will take that into a, into account. Um, and then, of course, there is the, the cons, which means if people don't like a certain thing, that can be something you need to deal yeah, with. Yeah, I've noticed. I've, I've already had physical threats. Physical threats. <laughs> yeah. Wayne, <laughs> well, it's just the topics yeah. that we cover, and it's not that we were being vicious or anything like that. It, it was just that sort of you know, whenever you start covering things like religion and mm. things like that, people can get a little bit passionate. Yes, <laughs> hey, but you know, if if you're getting that type of feedback, you're doing something right. If, if you're That's able to, to spark a conversation, because I mean, a podcast medium is very con conversationalist, it is. and then if you can get someone, especially because. For them to go out of their way to to say that because there's not exactly a comment section on Spotify or, or no. iTunes. They need to f track you down and find I'm you. I'm getting hammered on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Check out Wayne's Instagram for well, any which, comments Which on in this. a way I know it works. Yes. I, I know the Instagram works because they're obviously tracking me down for Instagram. <laughs> hey, you've done something uh, right if you've uh, oh tracked God. someone down. At least it's that easy just to hit the block button. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, do you know... I know so many people have asked, how do you make money doing, especially my uncle? <laughs> he comes <laughs> from the, you know, the, 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 the 40s, you know, yeah. and 
like, Wayne, how do you make money? So a lot of people ask me, how, how does someone like you, do you remember the first time you were making a couple of dollars? Yeah, so it's, it's so interesting because this is very new media, like internet, podcasting. These things weren't around, you know, 20 years ago. Um, I mean, I think MySpace came out 15 years ago. Okay. And then now we've got, that's, that's a dead social platform. You now have Facebook, you have all these things. But at the end of the day, how I like to explain it to someone who may, like my parents, I had to explain it to them and be like, this is how I'm earning money. They're probably um, my age, aren't they? <laughs> like how old are you? How old is your mum and dad? Oh, uh, like 60. So no, are they younger age. than you? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, yeah, not yeah. No, no. They would be uh, way older. Yeah. Um, it, you know, YouTube, Instagram, podcasting, they still have the exact same roots as old media. Yeah. We see YouTube as just TV. So YouTube's free. You can tune in. You can watch it. You True. can not watch it. TV's the same. You can tune in for Channel 7 to watch the project and it's free. How it works is the advertising. So, you know, 10 minutes into like the television. project. Exactly. You'll get a KFC advert and then you'll get a Telstra advert. And you, you know, might just look on your phone or you might watch the advert and then the program comes back. That's one form of advertising that we have. So on YouTube. Was there's... that your first? Was that f the first income that you had was it, advertising? Definitely. Yes. So initially when we had um, very small numbers, especially in those few, you know, few months where it's just 10, 20, 50 subscribers, um, we are maybe getting a couple of cents from YouTube. Um, um, something. Yeah, something. Yeah. So they have it um, per 1,000 views. They might give you $3 and then they will take 45% um, of that $3. So okay. that's how they earn money and that's how we earn money. So that's a 45%. Yeah, they take 45%, which it's it's been like that from the start. So it's hard to kick up a stink, but also at the same time, they've built the infrastructure. They've built the platform. You know, I can choose to upload my videos anywhere else. It's almost like a bit of a take it or leave sure. it. Um, so you don't really have much say in that. Um, the other um, kind of options is just say you're tuning into a reality TV show, just like, just say Big Brother or something. And then maybe there's the housemates are eating a bucket of KFC. KFC is place, paid for that advertisement and that's built within the program. So that sure. would be like your product placement. Product placement. Um, we potentially have that as well. So sometimes we'll have a, just say Sony will reach out to us for a new camera and then they will pay for us to kind of put that camera out in front of our audience. Um, yeah. And those are really kind of the two main, especially if main you have things. the the viewers, if you have the, the subscribers that attracts the, the big guys. Yeah, definitely. I mean, honestly, if you compare it to how much, um, advertisers pay on TV compared to how much they pay on YouTube. Oh, I know. I worked, are, I worked in advertising for television. Yeah. We are getting the very short end of the stick, even though we have such a, um, you know, niche and specific audience, just say Qantas wanted to advertise on us for a 10th of what they would advertise sure. to be on channel seven, they would get a better outcome from ours because people are tuning into our channel to watch us traveling. For travel. Exactly. Mm. But people might be tuning in to watch um, Sunrise just to get the news. Like there could be someone that has no interest in travel, that has maybe just an interest in beauty, but Qantas sure. is still advertising on there and they're going for more of this shotgun approach and paying 10 times as much. So. In terms of our career, in terms of our job, it's very new days, even though YouTube's been around for just over 10 it's years. It's not a long time. It's not a long time at all. Um, you know, advertisers are still working it out, but the, the, the whole influencer industry has ballooned up in the last few years. So it's def definitely looking positive. I think it's several billion dollars now a year companies are spending, and that's just looking like a higher projection. Right. So in terms of people that were interested in doing this as a career, it's never a better time than right now. Right, right. So each video that you put out, you guys put out. Yeah. Um, what's your rough audience on that? Um, it really depends. So if we can have videos that can just be seen by our audience and it kind of just hangs around there. Um, within a week, because um, of course not everyone's sitting on YouTube yeah, every sure. single day. So you, it's hard to take it on that initial 24 hours. We give it a week and... It can be anywhere from 150,000 to 200,000 people right. just on YouTube. Um, we then re-upload our content to Facebook um, and that can get, you know, 40,000 views, right. anywhere up to 1.5 million views. Wow. Yeah. So that Facebook's a bit more of a wild west, but um, 
in terms of putting all those numbers, it can be a quarter of a million people tuning in wow. every week. And you get paid per views. Is that right on YouTube as well? Yes. Yeah. So um, paid per views if an advert is placed. So generally there'll be an advert at the beginning of the um, of the video. And then maybe we'll put a, an advert in the middle of the video, like a little bit of an ad break. So every time someone would watch an advert, um, we would get paid. Yes. Right. What's the maximum of ads that you can have on your channel? Was it up to you? I, I literally think it's up to you, but I mean, no one's not going to watch you vlogging. Be like, "Hi guys, welcome to," and then an advert. Yeah, that's Today so we're going annoying. to offer coffee. Advert. Mm. Um, I think you can. You definitely have to play with it. Um, I I kind of look at it similar to TV. So if it's a fifteen minute um, video, I'll put one at the at the start, and then maybe I'll put one in the middle as okay. well. Okay. Um, and a lot of people can pay for YouTube Red, which removes all the adverts, so you can watch ad free on YouTube these days. Um, but yeah, um, we don't generally get much bad feedback for the amount of ads. We, we're quite um, cautious with how many because yeah, I bet. you I don't bet. want to, you know. Then it becomes like free to air television. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the ads always come on at the worst possible oh, times. Yeah, <laughs> just before it gets good. <laughs> <laughs> Have you actually noticed that at the beginning of the show, there's less ads? And then as you, you know, True. get towards the end. True. Like just say you're watching, I don't know, The Bachelor and just before they pick the who the person, yeah. the ads just get work because you, you're yeah. invested. <laughs> yeah. So when, when a company sponsors, as in when a company wants to put an ad on, yes. does it depend on how big that company is to the pay that you get or is it a, f a flat rate? So there's two type of advertisements that we offer. One is done through Google, through the kind of the Google advertising AdWords program. We have no say on who gets advertised on there. They deal with YouTube. We just say that we will put an advert at the beginning of our video. And then I believe that the um, the company bids. So it's like an auction. So just say um, Qantas wanted to advertise on our YouTube channel and they say, we have a dollar to pay you per 1000 views, but just say Virgin comes along and they say, we'll pay you a dollar 25 per 1000 views. And then it can get into a bit of a bidding oh, war. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is when you can have topics like business, for example, or, um, how to sell on Amazon, which is a very lucrative business. Oh, yeah. yeah, because there's a lot of people selling courses. There's a lot of people who want you to buy their ebook. So you can get up to $25, $30 per 1,000 views. Wow. Yes. So depending on your niche on YouTube, you can, you can like I could put out a video, it gets 100,000 views and just say I get $500 for that. But the same person and just say the business niche could put out 100,000 views and they could make 10, 15 grand. So it's like, wow. And then it also depends on where they're watching. So we are primarily a travel channel. So just say if we have Americans, people from the UK, from Germany, which they're quite wealthy set up countries, um, we can get paid higher rankings, like higher money for them. But then just say we can have a, a video go viral in Turkey or Egypt, where they don't earn as much money as, you know, Americans and Germans and Australians do. So the ad revenue is much lower. So I could have a video go viral. That makes sense. Yeah, like a mm. million views in Turkey won't make me the same amount of money as a million views in Australia. Right. So it's a lot of different things wow. um, to kind of take into account. It must account. be nice at that tipping point where you were traveling and realizing that, okay, I can relax. I'm getting paid enough to pay my bills and everything. Yeah. Uh, that stress is off. Yes. Uh, do you remember when that was in your journey? Yes. Was it about three years in? It's three years in, yes. So that's when, of course, we changed everything. And I kind of said to Jess, because we wanted to keep doing this, I said, you know, 95% of businesses fail within their first three years. Sure. So our goal was always get to those three years. And then maybe if after the third year, we're still not making any money, maybe we needed to to mm. kind of readjust our approach. Um so it was about three years in. So the numbers definitely started to get a bit higher. We hit our 100,000, which was an amazing kind of accomplishment when yeah. that happened. Um, and then... I suppose that's the most special, yeah? yeah? I suppose even like when you hit a million and things like that, a million would be great. Yeah. But it's that first... Because you've worked so hard. So hard. For that for that first 100,000. Yeah. <laughs> it, it definitely was. And um, I think we both broke down when, when that happened. Because you're bet. just like... 100,000 people. Well, so it's much work as well. So much work. And you're right, because as you were saying, like that snowball gets bigger as yeah. there's more people. So from 100,000 to 200,000, I think it was maybe six months compared to three years wow. to get it. So it's like, 
it definitely You increases. see, that's a good thing for people to hear. Mm. Because, you know, when you watch these channels and you're watching these guys living that life, traveling around, you don't see the work that yeah. went in, that goes in behind, you know, um, behind the closed doors. You know, that's not on YouTube. You don't see the up at two, three in the morning trying to edit this thing, yeah. doing thumbnails, getting the music, the right music, because that's always a tough thing. Yeah, definitely. People don't see that. So, you know, there's that saying that people see the peak, but they don't see the mountain. Do you know what? I think we kind of do that to ourselves a little bit because you kind of like we kind of in the industry – you want it to look relaxing. You want it to look like, oh, I'm just here on the beach. Enjoying it. Enjoying mm. it because you're kind of selling the, whether it's the resort or if it's the, <laughs> the beach or whatever, you're kind of wanting people to put themselves in the shoe, in your shoes to be like, oh, I really want to go on that beach in Turkey or want to mm. go and see the pyramids in Egypt. You don't want them to um, necessarily see all the other end because then they're like, oh, I don't want to go to Egypt anymore because yeah. I can't eat the food there. The buses don't look that, you know. Showing them the side they don't know yeah, about exactly. Egypt, you know. I just, I was laughing because I just pictured you on the beach smiling, but your inner dialogue's like, I've shot so much fucking footage today. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how much editing I've got? <laughs> because yeah, as, a, as a filmmaker... Um, especially uh, when I've traveled, there's times where I just thought I've shot way too much today and, oh my God, I'm going to have to go through all this. Footage. Exactly. Yeah. It's honestly, it's Do something you get that you learn. sometimes? Like, yeah. I, I've hello everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I, de I definitely over time learned to shoot less, but like when you went to the pyramids, you're like, I'm never probably coming back to the pyramids. I want to film everything. There's the yeah. camel. I want to get this angle. And you get excited. Yeah, you do. You know, and in you photography it terms, it's called um, you're machine gunning it. So <laughs> yeah. you're just because you're so excited, you're like <laughs> exactly. But I, I suppose in film, it's it, it's a little different because there's times I've come back and I, I don't do it for a living. But there's times I come back and I just look at how much footage I've shot and I'm like, oh god, yeah. I'm gonna have to going to have to do this you just know, before the end of the last financial year i needed to um buy some 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 products just to bring my tax down a little bit and i finally invested in that's one nice. of the little synology nos systems which is like you you store terabytes and terabytes of footage and I had to buy my hard drives individually and i think i'm up to 50 terabytes of footage wow. over the last five years and now with my new camera coming in october where it's 4k that footage is now just are you going to shoot 4k I think so. Yeah, I've been waiting for uh, the little update so I can do 4K 60 because I do like to do a bit of slow motion in my yeah. videos and my older cameras just haven't had that, just 4K 30. So I said, nah, it's it's all, either all in or nothing. I bet, I bet. Yeah. Especially if you have a camera like that. And yeah. I suppose there's, there's, can I ask you? Yeah. What's your, it's going to be a tough one. Okay. What's your top two countries that you have visited that is most memorable? Most memorable. Do you know what? The one I always come to, and usually the short answer is I like to give one in each continent, but if we're being, you know, it's a podcast. And gun, yeah. So one of my most memorable countries has to be Turkey. Um, <sighs> Dying to go there. You need to go there, especially someone who loves history so much. I mean, I know you went to Egypt, which I'll get to that, <clears throat> but there's just still so much in Turkey as well. And I think Initially, um, in the media, Turkey sometimes doesn't get the best rap because it is right next door to Syria. So a lot of times they're just talking about that little belt there. But you don't need to go anywhere near there. I mean, we want I want to sneak into Syria. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That'll make an interesting podcast if that comes out. I'll, <laughs> I'll make sure I no, subscribe. But, yeah. So, um, I mean, you fly into Istanbul. It's the only city in the world split across two separate continents because right. it's, in, it's in Europe and it's in Asia at the same time. Do you know what Istanbul stands for? What it means? Uh, no, I don't it, actually. When they took it over the Romans, the Romans, it used to be Constantinople. Yes. Because Consta Constantine, uh, he was the leader of the religion of, of, he brought Christianity to the world, right? It means the eternal, this city. Okay. Istanbul, when the, um, Mohammed II, he was a young sultan, 24, I, I can't remember. He sacked the Roman empire. This young sultan. And what was he I broke, doing at 24? I know. Getting drunk in Northbridge? I mean, I this guy sacked the Romans. So Istanbul means the city. Wow. Yeah, which is really cool. Yeah, okay, you, know? you already need, once COVID's done, you need to book a trip there because yeah. you will love it. Well, that's that's coming after Israel and Jordan. Turkey's the next one. Okay. We were meant to go to Turkey this September. And wow. Israel, I think we were going in April. But all that's gone because of COVID. Yes. But yeah, so Turkey for you. 
Absolutely, because I mean, it's it's such a, a smorgasbord of different kind of cultures. I mean, on on face value, you can go into Istanbul and you think, oh, I'm in Aladdin, because you know, you 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 look at media and how you've perceived it <laughs> over the years, and then you walk in there, you're trying to pigeonhole because you're sure. trying to be like, if someone asks you how do you explain Istanbul, you you try to think, oh, what have they seen? So you kind of go in there, oh, you think okay. you're in Aladdin. And then you go down to the beaches and you feel like you're in Greece. I mean, it's like very Mediterranean, so beautiful. And then you go into the mountains, into Cappadocia, and you just need to go on Google if you haven't seen this. And they, they let off hundreds of balloons. Mm. One of the best experiences I've ever done. And you can go into the caves. So a lot of the Christians, they went and hid into the caves. And they, there's this whole underground city. And I remember going into one of the caves and they're... Um, I suppose their church, I don't know if I'm using the correct terms, but their religious place underground, they'd built it in the shape of a cross. So they'd like carved it oh, underground. I've seen that. I've seen that. And you can walk in and then you can look left and you're like, okay, that's the left side of the cross. That's the right side of the cross. And you're like, this is where these Christians will have their service every week. Wow. And it's underground in a city. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And the food there is whoa, so good. good. Yeah. We had one of these dishes in Cappadocia. They cook it and seal it inside of a clay pot. So they cook it in there, and then when he brings it out onto the table to you, it's just this perfectly clay pot, and he smashes it open in front of you. Wow. And you just eat it out of the clay pot. Yeah. Which is really cool. Yeah. I know someone, um, because this sometimes happens a lot, um, people maybe steal our images, and someone was actually in Cappadocia at a restaurant we ate in, and our photo of us at the restaurant (laughs) is on the cover of the thing, and someone sent us a photo. He's like, did you know this? I said, no, I don't, but that's very cool. I'd like to go back there and just (laughs) see (laughs) That restaurant. Wow. Yeah, but Turkey definitely. Was that for Jessica too? Or does she have her own favorites? No, we generally quite, I've been with Jessica for like 14 years now. We're kind of like merged into the same person. (laughs) Jocelyn and I, 30 years this year. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. You so guys need to do an episode with Jocelyn about relationship advice. I mean, 30 years, I'm sure a yeah, lot of I people... Yeah, I think I can talk about it. Yeah. I think I can talk about it. I'd um, like to see the banter between you and two, because... <laughs> well, she's promised to come on after uh, on the 100th podcast. On the 100th podcast. Get <laughs> her on like, the... Uh, oh, my God. On the gonna 20th. Be, that's going to be, like, years to come. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be but your 40th anniversary. We will need a someone like you to ask the questions. A mediator. I'd love yeah. to come down. That'd yeah. be fun. So, to stir things up a little bit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, back to your question. So Turkey's one of them. Turkey's one of them, and definitely Egypt's one of them. I mean, ever since your, I don't know, this is my personal experience, but my first kind of interest in travel has to be Egypt, because you kind of learn about the pyramids, mm-hmm. and you're like, wow, will I ever go and see the pyramids? And it's this ancient history, and even Egypt has a little bit of a bad rap for it. Like, people are easily would recommend you go to England, Germany, like nice, easy travel. It's so different, though. You go to Egypt and yes, it's it's not as easier to travel as just say London, um, but you get to Egypt and it's just an experience in itself. I mean, not only is it, yes, you start off with the pyramids in Cairo, but I feel like the, you know, once you leave Cairo is when Egypt starts getting interesting. Well, that, that was Jocelyn's experience. Jocelyn said, you know, for, for her childhood dream was to see the pyramids, but it wasn't her favorite when she got there. Yeah. You know, because we travelled all the way from Abu Simbel down south. Abu Simbel was my favourite. Uh, isn't that and amazing? And that was one of the last it's one of It was one stops. of mine too. Yeah. But we started there. And then we went all the way up to Alexandria, up north. See, I didn't do but, Alexandria. And we camped in with the Bedouins in the Western Desert amazing. as well. But yeah, no, it was fantastic. It yeah. was fantastic. So I can, I can understand when you said Egypt. You yeah. Because you're in awe all the time. All the time. And I mean... It's a total different culture. And of course, like there is a, um, a big heavy like Muslim influence there. So of course, coming from Australia where, you know, there is religion here in Australia, but it's not to the point where it's the entire culture. So you just go in in there. Yeah. You're taking it all in. It's kind of like, let's throw you in the deep end and you need yeah. to, sw- and you've never swam before and you need to go out. But the food was great and there. And you, you have to assimilate. Yeah. In that and that, that was so friendly though. I mean, you get yeah. you get pestered a lot, of course. On, if you go to the sooks, yeah, yeah. But that's that, that's half the that's, fun though. That's I think half the fun. You need to have that mentality when you're going into the sooks of yeah. Everyone, I mean, but I mean, if you've been to Kuda and Bali, come on, it's like <laughs> like they pester you for bintang tops there as well. I mean, True. This is at least like nice True. silk in, in in in. But I, I have to say, the one reason why that trip was so good for us is because of our guide. Yes. We had 
one of the best guides and he became a really good mate. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And he was an Egyptologist, but a lot of the other tour guides, he was going up to them and correcting them that's on what so they good. were saying. That would have been fun to watch. <laughs> oh, yeah. But in a really, you know, he'd go up and say, look, you're like my brother. Yeah. You're, you're in my industry. But when you said this about the high priest, they, the high priest don't wear white. Mm. Just between you and me. Oh, that's nice. Uh, for the next time. And we'd hear him going up and correcting. But he was so knowledgeable, but so laid back. Yeah. He had a great sense of humor. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually, he's invited me back to go film some tours there. Wow. And he said he'll pay for everything. Take that. Hey, you're <clears throat> jumping into my industry here, Wayne. No, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll recommend you. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I learned to, to film from you, Wayne. I think you're the best. Yeah, but I don't have this. the audience. You know? <laughs> hey, on the podcast, if 26,000 people. If he turns around and goes, oh, well, who's your friend? And he looks you up, you know, I'll just be left in the dust. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so Turkey and Egypt for you. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's interesting that you say um, about the guide, because I think for some people, when they think guide, they either think, oh, is it dangerous or... Is this not a a country that I can do on my own? Because, of course, there's a lot of people that just want to go backpack and just go through it. But I think Egypt's one of those countries you need a good guide for. You do. You do. I remember. Language. Yep. Language, because, of course, everything is in um, a completely different language over there. Like just the signs you you can't read. But also just you get a better experience. Like I was at a temple. I think it was the Crocodile God Temple. Oh, I was there. Yep. And I just Yes, exactly. Beautiful temple. It was. I just walked past some hieroglyphics because after being in 13 days, it does, you know, you kind of just walk past some and you, oh, yeah, cool. I've seen this before. But we walked past some and he said, no, 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 stop. The medical? Uh, not the medical. No, no. The first uh, medical tools uh, ever. They did the say mo- that. Yeah. Yes. Um, but at the same place, the very first calendar was etched into the side of the uh, temple. Oh, okay. And he just, we just walked past it. And I think he, he does this to the people just to make you realize, no, no, you need to study more. And this was the very first calendar. Yeah. And if I was there by myself, I would have just walked past it and then just left. Do you know what else was at that place? And we overheard it. It just came with such a, it's where Cleopatra used to take her baths. Yes. That bath, that bath. Well, our our guide said it. We thought he was joking. Yeah. And we just kept walking. And it wasn't until we got back to the hotel (laughs) Well, we, he said, no, that was where Cleopatra wow. took. And I was like, oh, God, because he was joking so much yes. anyway. But, um, yeah, I remember that. That was an amazing, amazing temple. All of Egypt. I mean, I was there for 13 days and each day was a new new experience. Yeah. And, and like with, I can totally relate to Jocelyn. Like you think going to the to Egypt, the pyramids is the peak. Yeah. Um, I definitely think by the end of it, you're like, no. Like Abu Simbel, some Abu of the Simbel. other ones are mm. oh, amazing. Dendera. Did you go to Dendera and Abydos? They they were about two, three hours away. Potentially not. But they were, how can I say it? They had these, these oh, what are they, restorations happening. Okay. Where all the um, hieroglyphs were coming back to life in colour. Wow. It looked amazing. Wow. <clears throat> it looked amazing. And we went to this island called Elephantine. And it wasn't until later I realized it was one of the places that um, hosted the Ark of the Covenant wow. when it left Israel. Wow. Um, and you're a big Indiana Jones fan. I'm a huge <laughs> Indiana. Actually, I shouldn't say it, 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 it's a theory. It was okay. a theory of a guy that I read. So because of the temple there was built in a similar format of the Temple of Solomon that was built on top, you know, under the Dome of the Rock. Yes. And that was to house the Ark of the Covenant. I was so angry when I didn't know that when I was there because I was walking around telling the mythology of of why that place was so symbolic to yes. me. Um, but yet I didn't know it was one of the no sort of resting places of the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, I could see why you kick yourself on yeah, that one. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. So any, any other countries? So oh, Egypt, yeah. um, Turkey. Oh, I can just keep going. So I love Japan. <laughs> Japan is just, oh, you need to go. I think because I'm a little bit of a nerd, love my video games, love watching movies. And then you you go to Japan and one, the food there is next level. And it's not just like, yeah, it's not just like sushi. There's so much more Mm. to it. And um, we had this one experience when we were out there in in Japan and uh, luckily we were with the tourism board. So there was, um, you know, a translator there. But 
when we went out to the to the water where the fishery the fisheries are and they literally bring the fish in fresh and then there's an auction and they just in Japanese getting buying the fish and then they shove it into the back of their van take it to the restaurant for lunch now you would think that the fish is caught fresh that morning and then by the time you get to lunch that's when you eat your food mm. no they understand that everyone is going out to eat lunch so that's why they literally from 11 o'clock they buy the food and then it's cooked up for you at 12. That's called like farm to table wow. right there. And we followed the truck to the restaurant and then we had the man cook us sushi. Such an amazing experience. And of course the culture there is just next level. It's it's literally like being in an, in an anime when you're there. <laughs> well, do you know, my sister said that. Yeah. She stopped there for a few days on the way to America and she wasn't even looking forward to it. She said it was one of the highlights of the trip because she said it was it wasn't just a different country. It was a different world. Yeah. Like you walked into another world. And everyone's you know? so polite there. And, you know, it, you, yeah, it's, you go to Japan and it's, it's next level. Definitely skip your Bali trip. Go to Japan. I watched your videos in oh, Japan. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Especially when you went to, I think it was the old war memorials like in Hiroshima and stuff. One of the best war museums I've yeah, ever been to. I saw because that. I've been to Pearl Harbor and you, I've you, been there. you see the American mm. side of it. But then you go to Hiroshima and that museum, yes, millions of people were affected by this atomic bomb, but the way that they do it is they pick someone, they pick a little child and they make say it, that short. Make it personal. Make it personal. This little child coming home from school and then having to run to the, to the river because they're just melting from this thing. And that <sighs> just, that hits you because sometimes as the human race, you can't comprehend the million, but if someone just picks a story... Do you know you're so ah? Uh, we know that because of storytelling. You know, mm. we brought were brought up, but that really hit home what you just said because I don't cry a lot. Mm. I don't tear up a lot. So. When I do, I do. Do you know it was two days ago? I was watching. You know the bomb that went off in in Lebanon in Lebanon yeah. in Beirut, but they per they had this one a lady and a family that were filming the bomb. Wow, and. You know, at the end they were covered in glass. It was about the mother, mm. and I teared up looking at that because I I actually thought of can you imagine what it would have been like in Nagasaki in Hiroshima, mm -hmm. just to to have within seconds this devastation and not know what's happening. Especially yeah, because the forties. I mean, it's not <sighs> people aren't going on Twitter and TikTok to see the news. I no. mean, it's like like you said, having a kid go through that yeah. and having his skin melting off and crawling to get to the water. Yeah. I just can't, I, you can't fathom something like that happening, you know? I know. Wow. Especially here in Australia, like we've... We, well, the j last 50, 70 years has yeah. been relative, I mean, there's been perpetual war, but not world devastation war, mm. you know? And touch wood, hopefully it doesn't happen. Well, remember the, way the start of 2020, going. World War Three was meant to happen? I mean, how crazy of a year was yeah. this? I mean, from, from that to the fires to COVID, it's just been... I know, I know. One, one after, after another. another. Yeah. And then you've got, you know, the threats with China and the United States and, you know, what's happening in Hong Kong and Taiwan and the South Pacific Sea and, oh, my God. And in a way, um, I had to stop looking at that. I had to stop it because... Yeah. It was just affecting me too much. So Same. I was watching more comedies. Same. I was looking at more fun stuff online. And I just changed my mindset, you know, in, in that way, because it was just one thing after another. And and you're only human. I mean, I yeah. I was looking for a new Netflix show and a lot of people were recommending Dark, the show shot in Germany. Yeah, it's heavy. Yeah. So we started the first episode and we were just like, um... <laughs> <laughs> this looks amazing. I'll get to this, but I just need to put a comedy on because like now. right now. And then even with hand, Handmaid's Tale, people were recommending and Jess was saying, it's heavy. I, I'm a new mom. I don't think I can watch this no. because of that whole side. So we're in this limbo where you just want a, a little bit of, of. You want just something, something a little lighthearted. Yeah. I mean, both of what you just said, dark and handmade. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's nothing like, oh, God, yeah. seeing this post-apocalyptic world. Yeah, I mean, I love those type it. of shows. I mean, Watchmen has been my favorite show of the year so yeah. far, and that's quite, yeah, aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Steve, <laughs> so actually speaking of that, yeah, new mum, you're a new dad. Yes, yeah. And uh, and uh, your your baby daughter's Hunter, she's two months old. She sure is, yeah. Um, how has that 
How has that changed things with your outlook on what you're doing for all business as a travel as travellers? Yeah, of course. So if we we're talking if we're talking about that side with our YouTube channel, I mean, with the last five years, our kind of goal is to inspire people to go out there and travel. And you know, I could quite confidently say that we we're quite expert travellers. Like I would say, you could put us in a situation and we might not have a breakdown necessarily. Um, so have you had a breakdown? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Many times because you just put in the middle of nowhere and you're just like, how do I get out of this situation? But, um, I feel like over the last five years, we've, we've learned from that. Do you show that on YouTube? Um, in some cases, yes. And it's not that we're wanting to hide certain content from people, but we look at our channel is very, um, PG Disney sure. rated. Not uh, like fuck the passports have been stolen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I think like how we see it and there's a million channels out there that people can go watch. If someone goes in and tunes in to watch SpongeBob, you're, you're just tuning in to watch SpongeBob. You're not tuning in to watch him talk politics. Sure, sure. There are other channels. You can just flip it to the news. You can go away from Nickelodeon. For us, we have um, my family's watching it, which, um, you know, they wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be swearing around my family yeah, or sure. doing like um, X-rated things that they... So that's what we initially thought and... Not in front of camera. Yeah. Behind cameras. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is going down. <laughs> Where are we taking this? This is not flying the nest. It's a Wayne Nicholson show. <laughs> so you leave all the naughty stuff for outside the camera. Yeah. I mean, hey, I'm a, I'm a person that, you know... I swear and all that type of stuff, yeah. but we just don't choose to show it on there because people tune in to just kind of forget. And especially in recent times with COVID, we see so many comments of people saying, I just had a bad day and I came in to tune into your channel and you made me smile. And that's and all we've, an we've, we've, it's, a, it's an escape. Mm. Yeah. There's other channels out there where you can go, um, for your more kind of political centered or yeah, sure. this, this channels out there that do amazing jobs of just going through and showing all the hardships of travel. Sure. Good on them. That's So fine. that's a lesson. Know your audience. Know your audience, know your niche. Sure. Um, and yeah, definitely cater to them. And so you would, we were getting at oh, new yes. dad. New dad. Yeah. Amazing. Best adventure I've ever been on. I mean, I'm I so, bet. so happy. Like definitely for the last few years, Jess has been hounding me for a child, but we've both just come to the agreement that if we had children anytime sooner, we wouldn't have had Hunter because of course the whole race with uh, reproduction, you know, like who, who gets there first, like we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had Hunter and she's just so good for sure, us. Sure, sure. And I think going forward on our kind of our channel, we, once COVID kind of calms down, we want to inspire families that you can go out there and travel. Cause I think a lot of people will, will agree with me on this, that a lot of people think travel is over once you have kids. Do you know what? I think you're going to have a bigger audience there. Yeah. Because so many people, like you said, that have children, they would love to see two parents and a young child yeah. traveling out there and learning about that travel on how to travel with a young child, especially the places that you go to. Yeah. I think that will be a massive audience for you. And I think even me and Jess have been talking about is showing more of maybe the hardships of that because even we went on a little trip down to Bunker Bay just um, a couple of weeks yes. ago. And we showed them, we said, we've overpacked, like, this is crazy, but we're documenting this so that in a few years time, we figured it out. So we're definitely open to doing a lot more of that because of course there is pros and cons to, to travel, but we, we want to, I'd love to take Hunter to Egypt and go through the sooks and just, you know, have that experience so that if people think, oh, wow, they've gone to Egypt, which sure. I would say is definitely a more complicated country to travel to. And I can easily just go to Bali or London or America and definitely. So, you know, I mean, we would have already booked a trip by now if it wasn't for, <laughs> for COVID. We we're ready to go to Europe to to go somewhere nice. Yeah. But um, Jocelyn's dying. She's dying because she just looks forward to traveling, and she's dying because she doesn't know when this thing is going to start up again. We don't know. So, um, I mean, when I chatted to you like three four months ago, we thought by August. Maybe we'd be in Cairns because Jess's parents are there. They haven't met their granddaughter yet. So we thought by now we we would be over there, but you just don't know. Jeez. So yeah. so what lessons? I mean, do you know if you're heading into the parental travel? Yep. Can I take your audience into the adventure travel? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Let's take them to the uh, to Egypt. Uh, Did you said, hear that flying the nest? Like, just come over to me. I'll I'll look after the adventure side. Definitely. And if you've got kids. 
move over to flying the nest. Come check out Wayne. He's very knowledgeable. When because you travel quite quite interestingly, when you go to a country, you like to research everything. Yeah, we do you like go. six months of research, and only because we love it. We love. We, we travel to the places of historical interest. Israel, Jordan, and yeah. Turkey. And we've been to Greece wow. twice already. Um, but that was my dream to go to Greece because I knew a lot about the ancient Greece, uh, the history, the politics. Yep. Uh, I also loved the mythology. Yes. One reason why I headed into storytelling, would you believe, wow. was uh, because of Greek mythology. I rem- one of the first movies that really shook me before Indiana Jones and all of that was Clash of the Titans. Oh, okay. And, and the, the older one, not the this old remake one. with yeah, the old one and Jason and the Argonauts, the yes. older one and things with like stop that. Stop animation and that. So when I was into film, I would always, even, you know, besides film, I would always read Greek mythology. Amazing. Same. I loved it. I wish in school we learned Greek mythology, oh. but they would just, they'd probably think, no, it's not real. Like, Let's just teach you about Nazi Germany. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I wish we learned about Nazi Germany, but <laughs> oh, you did? We, oh. no, we were learning more Australian history. As I time. think everyone does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I, I got into history. I loved it. I mean, I bought, speaking of Nazi Germany, I wanted to know what made Hitler Hitler. Mm. I read, I was 22 when I read Mein Kampf, what mm-hmm. he wrote in jail he wrote his memoirs of Mein Kampf. But I just love that side and I love Greek history. And so, yeah, that's how we travel. Imagine we, being able to get him on a podcast these days. Oh. Just put him. Would well, you know Andrew Ma? If you ever know a guy, Andrew Ma did a uh, history, like a history channel, but for the BBC mm-hmm. on the history of the world. And he starts with the first woman in Africa. Do you know we watched that series? And we got our notebooks out and we said, okay, we need to travel here. We need to see where he's gone. He's gone. He's, and we've followed Andrew Mars journey. <laughs> hey, that's amazing. So I mean, I, just like people would follow our kind of itineraries through these different countries, you've just found a different medium to do that, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah. And so far it's just for us, you know, yeah. like we've just been videoing for our own records. I suppose how you started. Exactly how we started. I yeah. how you started. Because, you know, we always sit here and go... Uh, who wants to listen to an old fart like me? That's <laughs> what we, no, no, there's definitely <laughs> YouTube channels out there with an older demographic. I'll have to put you in, in touch with some. Yeah, why not? Yeah, definitely. Well, especially in that sort of way. So, yeah. so what advice would you give to people that are heading into the world of travel videos for YouTube? What sort of advice would you give them, Steve? First of all, I'd definitely say um, you need to understand that it's a lot of work. I know on the on the glossy side of it, when you see the output, it looks very easy. Just take a pretty photo on a beach. But there's so much more. It's like an iceberg. Like what's underneath the water is where all the work is. Yeah. And for us, it took us three years of backbreaking work with next to no income before we started earning a couple of dollars our way. So it's definitely a bit of a long tail, I think. Um, But if it's your passion, follow it. I mean, it's if I didn't decide to quit my job with my wife five years ago, I don't think I'd be on this podcast chair with you right now. I would probably just be working my normal day job. I mean, I'd have still called you on. Oh, thanks, buddy. Appreciate (laughs) it. (laughs) But it definitely like we were both just working our normal jobs. You can look at it now and you can see the numbers now, which is amazing. There were there was a time when there weren't any numbers. And if there's something you want to follow, whether it's videography, photography, podcasting, or if you're an artist, or if you just want to do something that's out of the norm, just follow it. Um, and just, yeah, chase your dreams. Because at the end of the day, I would hate to be on my deathbed and have regrets. You I know, that's, that's what you said there. Regret is always worse than fear definitely. of not doing it at the beginning. 100%. I would rather you know, tried something and it failed. And then I can sit back and say, it makes you I a better it. human being traveling, doesn't it? I, I, I think it don't definitely you, opens don't up. Don't you notice a difference when you talk to people that have traveled? They, there's a, a little bit they, more open minded. They're open. They're a little bit, they're wise, Yeah, you know, with, with, uh, with different things and cultures and people just in the way they converse. Yeah, uh, I think it's, I think it's, medicinal for everybody. I think it's, everybody should yeah. travel to places they wouldn't necessarily go and uh, and have that. There's people I know that haven't traveled outside of WA, Western I, Australia. I um I grew up 
Uh, well, when I first moved to Australia, I moved to a small town of Norseman, just next to Kalgoorlie, 600 people, right? And the librarian at the school was born in Norseman and she's never left it. Wow. And, and I think, I don't know how old she is now, but maybe 50, 60, and she's never left that little town. Oh, wow. And, you know, all for her, definitely, but, wow, there's so many uh, yeah. experiences out there. Listen, for people who, ha for those uh, minority that haven't seen Flying the Nest, <laughs> Um, where can they contact you? Yeah, definitely. So I'm just about everywhere. Um, so we have a Facebook page to search Flying the Nest. Of course, YouTube is definitely a, where we put most of our content out there. But if you just want to personally reach out to me, um, I've got an Instagram account, go through our messages all the time. All under Flying the Nest. Um, so Flying the Nest, it would be, we have separate Instagram accounts. So we have our Flying the Nest one. But if you just search that, you'll be able to find a hyperlink to my personal oh, okay. Instagram. Jess's personal Instagram you can just come have a chat. More than happy to, to, you know, if you have any more questions about how I kind of make this as a living. Oh, they're going to love this podcast. I well, can tell you that as And well. for everyone that's kind of come from Fly in the Nest, check out Wayne. He's got some interesting <laughs> interesting stuff on here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, I know you have to go, but thank you so much for coming on. And I can't wait to get you back on to talk about future projects that you can't talk about now. Yeah, there's so much fun stuff I'd love and, to talk about. And give my love to Jessica and Young Hunter me give her a hug we'll have to get a hunter on the podcast yeah <laughs> thanks buddy thanks wayne see ya